And it's been a very busy day at the headquarters of the uh, electricity company of Ghana today. Workers of the company have been demonstrating. Security has been heightened after the workers grew violent and began to break glass doors. Well, it's all to demand removal of their managing director, Robert Jamina. They say he has gone past his retirement age and must leave. <laughs> On, and this meeting came on the 5th of September. On the 6th, the letter was presented to him. And we wrote to the board and we copied the Ministry of Power. As we are speaking now, if maybe from here, before we will get response from our letter, we don't know. Good. But as we are speaking now, we have not heard anything. But on the 28th, that was last week Wednesday, was his retirement age that one it is not anybody yeah. and we believe oh, Senate should have written to him to remind him that he have to go honorably we heard that he celebrated his sister's birthday at the head office which has never happened to any country before we all know in the time past our all our MDs at least they all had something to the system it's an improvement to enhance our efficiency we know what our former engineer Sefas Gakpo did. He expanded our network. We all know what our Reverend Engineer Otimensa came and did. He also, he also, they, they all came and helped. Even today, when you pass by some of our regional offices, you see the nice edifices he has put in place for us. And he also improved the system for us. Uh, we also believe that our this our current MD has also done his best. So if at 60, you have done your best. At 61, what can you have to it? Nothing. So we think it is very good. It's very good that at this particular point in time, honorably, it should go on its retirement. Because as we have heard, I mean, reliably being informed, that he has been given one year extension. No, no. That is where we are not happy about. And we said, as workers' voices, as we have gathered here, we are from various regions, all the ECD operational areas. That is what has gathered here. <laughs> Now, some of the workers also raised concerns over his alleged involvement in the ECG concession process. The concession is another battle we are fighting, but this, that, but this is another part of it. What we are telling the president to do is that we want the president to know that we, the workers and the staff of ECG, are not very happy if he thinks that somebody should be given the extension. Because the reason why the push of the concession is because some of them think we are incompetent. Some of them think we are, not in, we are inefficient, we cannot deliver. And so therefore, if you have a team that is not delivering, why do you keep on using the same team? We don't want to be working with the MD while people think that he should be in office. No, we love him. He's our father. We want him to know that he has done his part. And therefore, he should go and rest. We don't want people to come and disturb him. Now, we understand the police have invited leadership of the uh, ECG Workers Union for questioning. Earlier, the police at the demonstration grounds. The police read out uh, portions of the Public Order Act where they said the workers were violating. What you, are doing. Okay. you have but a we should have notified you. You should have notified us five clear days. Okay. If you have, I will know. So please. What you are doing so what, is against the law. So what do you advise now? You should stop and clear and follow the rules. Okay. okay please. So okay. write to the police okay. five clear days okay. we, and I've all already indicated. Mm -hmm. At 491, oh, no. it's available. I can give this one to you yeah, yes, so yes. that you can go and, and read. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But what we will do is that you have heard you. We, maybe we didn't know that that was what we were supposed to do because this is our premises. Please. This is, no, I'm, this I'm, is, I'm, this I know. Is, I know. This is a public place no, I know. and you cannot. Officer, no, I understand ma Madam, you. Madam, we understand, understand you perfectly. With what so, so, we are... We understand. But as we are speaking now, our management has... has we are having a meeting and they want to call us. In fact, you call can go and be by this people. I know you are the organizer. These people must be here because this place is a public place and the law doesn't allow you to be here. So, please, I want your work to be very easy and I wish you also be very easy. 
Thank you very much. So please let them be here. Let them live here. Yeah. And then if you follow the rules, okay. we will come and then we'll do what is expected Thank you very much. Us, as police officers. Thank you, do you understand? Thank you very okay. much. Okay. So, so you go and join the buses. If you respect me as your leader, I don't want any noise. Let, uh, let us go back to TUC and I will address you accordingly. So please. So this process is simply about uh, Mr. Jamana, who is the MD of, of ECG. And we need to learn about him. What about him, in fact, uh, do we know uh, so far? It's, it's a gentleman uh, that uh, we know has been at the helm uh, for a while. He's uh, um, in November 2014, uh, became the acting director. Uh, March 2012, uh, became the uh, managing director, uh, substantive managing director for ECG. Uh, in 1993, he joined the ECG as assistant uh, uh, geodetic engineer. Now, other positions, the director of procurement and materials and transport, he's held that position as well. Uh, he's, he's one of those people who have risen to the ranks uh, to, this, to this point as the managing director. But the workers uh, say uh, they, they simply do not like the fact that he's, uh, he's outlived uh, he's, uh, he's reached the, the, pen, the age of pension and is still being kept there uh, on a, a one-year extension. Uh, we'll bring you more on this, on this developing story uh, from uh, the ECG. We'll be speaking uh, to a correspondent who was there uh, following this story for us uh, and getting the sense of how the, the police managed to resolve this unpass over the uh, possible breach of the of the act, a public order act that has been cited by the police already, but also what management have been saying about today's uh, protest. We'll also attempt to speak to the uh, acting uh, power minister who possibly will join us on the telephone line also uh, on, on the ensuing agitations uh, in the ECG. And you, I'm sure you know that the ECG, there's a lot of focus on the ECG now, uh, m m mainly because of the concession process that is still ongoing uh, and government is insistent that that process needs to go through. We've already signed a, a compact uh, with the uh, with the Millennium Challenge account that is, of course, a lot of money, almost $500 million uh, to be put in reviving the energy sector. Uh, that's one of the key things that uh, one of the preconditions that we need to meet uh, to bring in a private sector uh, participant into the process of uh, uh, distributing uh, electricity and that concession process has been has been one of the issues that uh, the workers have objected to and as, as you can see on the street on the screens that objection that protest that uh, has uh, spilled over from the fight uh, against the concession is what is again playing out uh, in what we're seeing with their objection to government's insistence that uh, Mr. Jamana, the current MD, should stay on for an additional year uh, because uh, they believe uh, he is uh, supporting government to sell off uh, ECG to a private uh, investor. And they've broken some glasses there uh, today. It's, uh, it was a pretty chaotic scene, as, as we've come to know now. Uh, the police tried to come uh, things a bit more. You see a lot of policemen armed to the teeth uh, down in numbers trying to make sure that further uh, life and property uh, are not uh, destroyed uh, in the process uh, of today's uh, protest. And we, so we see if we could get um, if we can get the uh, power minister on the telephone lines and ask him a few questions but also the workers, the representatives of the workers themselves uh, also on, on the line uh, as this unfolds. And it appears they're not uh, letting their guard down. They are going to proceed with what we're seeing today. And they've made it absolutely clear that as far as the concession process is concerned, they will permanently object to it. And this is just a further uh, complication of an already tense situation at the ECG. My colleague Matuda. Uh, when I got was there uh, with uh, our crew covering this. Matilda, so tell me, the, the, the security situation we just witnessed, how was it resolved eventually after the, the portions of the law was quoted to the, to the workers? Exactly. So uh, when the police arrived, they had to disperse them because uh, the workers were insisting that that 
place is their office. That is where they work. So mm. uh, they, they are free to do whatever they want. But, you know, management uh, of ECG were not aware of this uh, protest that was organized by mm. some members of uh, the, the staff. So they refused to receive the petition, which was supposed to be presented mm. to, to the board earlier. They refused. So the police had to be called in after they, br uh, they broke the glass because they were denied access into the main building. Because they wanted to access the they, management? They, they wanted to access uh, the main building, whether to go to the uh, MD's office, no one knew. What Possibly exactly. forcibly remove him uh, from the office. Exactly. Did, we know, did we know at the time if the MD was on the premises? Uh, the information I got was that he was in the office mm. that morning, but he refused to come out. It was the PRO who came out trying to calm some of the ECG. Mr. Watting? Exactly. So he was trying to calm some of the ECG workers, but uh, after he realized that they were not... Uh, adhering to what he was saying that was when the police had to be called in to disperse them and it, it, it later came out that they had no permit or whatsoever to organize that so they had to disperse them and then they later reconvened at TUC where they addressed some of us and then told us what it exactly had triggered to this protest. Did they say though that I heard one of the workers say that well they're going to try and do the right thing but it, 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 the sense was that this is going to continue. Yes, they, they, they say they are going to continue until they hear something positive because what they are standing on to do uh, this, uh, this protest is that uh, they have gotten some information that uh, money, uh, the board intends extending uh, the, the term of duration of an for office year? for another year for this MD who they according to them this time expired somewhere last week mm. and they are saying the right the process is supposed to be that uh, he's supposed to proceed on leave but till date he's yet to uh, embark on that leave and so they are saying that they are going to to agitate until government or the president comes in to address the issue you've been following this ECG back and forth for a while I get a sense and tell me if that's true I get a sense that this is just a byproduct of their opposition to the concession process and that they see him as the man at the helm working in concept with government to sell off ECG to a private investor and that is why they are objecting to him continuing stay they've been praying for him to go <laughs> so they get somebody else in who will sort of back them against government and exactly. so to put this man there for another year is it going to prolong their pain that's what it, this is really is about exactly so the argument these workers are making though they are not so uh, loud with it. They are not so clear with uh, this uh, accusation. They are saying that he's also behind the concession process. Mm. And one thing they find interesting is that if uh, you are accusing ECG of mismanagement, of it being inefficient and all that, mm. and this is the man in, in, in charge of everything at ECG, how do you retain the same person if you intend doing this uh, concession process? Mm -hmm. So that is the confusion there. So they are saying that they are not asking him to, to retire. It is compulsory. He's supposed to go on a, a retirement at this stage. Not, it's not something they are requesting for. Mm -hmm. It is something that legally he's supposed to embark on. So that is why they are raising some of these concerns. And yes, uh, they are linking him to the concession process. Matela, thank you very much. Now, we'll move on now to uh, another story that's been running today. Uh, tomorrow, all attention will again be on the Kumasi Metropolitan Assembly as they make a safe attempt uh, in many months to elect a presiding member. Now, previous votes have either resulted in a stalemate and sometimes violence. They have another chance as the Assembly members there to pre prepare to vote tomorrow. Ahead of that, head of Security Council in the region, Alexander Akon, uh, is urging the Assembly members to avoid the temptation of resorting to violence. Now, we can speak to Rasis Asari Donko, uh, who's been covering this uh, election and protracted disputes for us. Uh, he's on the telephone line with us right now. Rasis, tell us what, what's, what the build-up has been uh, towards this make-or-break uh, attempt to get another presiding member elected. Well, there is skepticism um, with the assembly members and, in fact, all stakeholders um, on whether, indeed, we will get a presiding member come tomorrow. And they are building their argument from uh, the fact that we, we used to have entrenched positions taken by uh, the various factions within the assembly uh, based on Nana Kofi Senya, who they... Uh, see as an NPP uh, staunch activist, and then Nana Dumhine, who was also considered a government appointee, and 
uh, working under government. Uh, so when they two steps aside, they voted people again to, 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 to be nominated in their state. And that is Honorable Aduse for that year, Swaba, and um, Abraham Bwadi for Ridge in Shia's electoral area. And so it's the same division that we do have uh, people who were following Senya are now following Abraham Bwadi. Uh, people who were following Nana Dumini are now following Aduse. And so there are many who think that it's going to go that way unless tomorrow they decide to bend the rules and this time around whoever gets the majority will have a yes or no vote uh, put on him and if he comes out with two thirds then we'll have a, a presiding member so there are people who think the uh, rules should be tweaked a bit uh, to produce a result tomorrow so in essence n not enough has changed to give people confidence that tomorrow we won't have a repeat of what happened last week when there was a huge fight. We'll be looking at that uh, on, on the screens where people were throwing punches, etc. Not much has changed to, to change that, that going into tomorrow's vote. Exactly, Evans. And indeed, uh, though they've been campaigning, behind the scenes, a lot has been going on. Uh, those who are lobbying and trying to uh, bring people from the other divide to the other side. And in fact, uh, there are attempts uh, to woo uh, followers from that side to agree that, hey, we need a presiding member. So why don't we all agree to follow this particular person? Because if you look at the two, they are all considered NTP activists. Just that they think that uh, government appointees are following this particular candidate. That's honorable, as you say. And others are following uh, Abraham Bodhi. And so we still have to be divided. There are attempts to lobby one side to join the other side. If that happens well, then there could be a presiding member. Other than that, they need to tweak the law, like I said. If they go through the first voting, whoever gets the highest number will then be put to a yes or no vote so that they could get a two-thirds uh, to emerge as presiding member. That is what uh, people are saying should happen uh, to produce a better result tomorrow. So really at the heart of all this is politics. Exactly. It's been politics day one, it's been politics day two, and it's now politics. The whole event at the assembly level is politics. In fact, when we, do, we, we did have um, an NTP uh, mayor, uh, we still had, even within the NTP itself, some factions, those who have vested interest, those who think that this presiding member will advance my cause, and so I'm following him. Now, we have an NDC, uh, so to speak, mayor, appointed mayor, and now they think that there should be an NPP presiding member to serve as a check on him. And so the presiding member position is now the preserve of the new patriotic party. And so you find political activists rooting solidly behind them, even at the assembly hall, the voting area, they are there in support, both NDC and NPP. I see. Uh, Erasmus, thank you very much uh, for that update. And we're joined on the telephone line right now by Alexander Akon, who is uh, called for calm ahead of the vote. He's the Ashanti Regional Minister. Mr. Alexander Akon, thank you for your time here on the polls. Yeah, thank you very much and good afternoon. So tell me, I mean, going into tomorrow, you've called for calm, but are you confident that tomorrow's vote will come off without incident, such as we witnessed last week? Uh, to be honest with you, if you put it in perspective, the incident last week happened outside the hall. Mm. The desire to get a presiding member is high on the agenda. And the feeling of the entire membership has changed towards the realization as compared to not getting and losing a lot of uh, advantages due to the assembly. So the atmosphere is good, and I'm much more convinced that we can get a presiding member tomorrow. Okay. T t t share with us what is uh, influencing this confidence. What has happened since last week that, of well, course, have changed I the atmosphere? I don't know. It's about the system meeting we are going as regards this particular position. Mm -hmm. And if anybody have observed the last meeting, they would have seen the desire to get the objective. If you are really sense the floor, it would have been easier. And coming from there, what I hear from outside is that this time we should get a presiding member. So that position alone is enough. I mean, 6th October would be one, one year when the assembly was inaugurated. So one year should be more than enough for us to get the presiding member. Uh, it may not go smooth. It may not be easy. It will not go one touch. But the process, if it should come to the crunch, 
will be gone through and eventually we should emerge with a presiding member. The last time, we made a lot of effort, even to close as late as and people did not complain. The desire was there. We should advance it again tomorrow. Okay. Now, I understand there are at, at least two people who will be, uh, uh, you, will be voted for tomorrow and that it must that some lobbying had to go on um, so that people will just have a consensus candidate of a sort. Are the people ready to, to have that? Well, let them not talk for the people because I'm not the people. I'm the acting chief executive. But when we left the last time, there were two people who were going to count on. None of them achieved the two thirds. So it is procedurally to go, but eventually the legal regime will be gone through. So uh, I'm sure we'll overcome that situation tomorrow. And while this is going on, I know we, we have, what, a few, a month and a half or so to the election. You are a very busy man. You are a candidate yourself. Plus, you have the added challenge of becoming the uh, acting chief executive for the Kumasi Metropolitan Assembly. How is it affecting development, day-to-day -day running of, of the city? Well, obviously, the most important of them is that we should get an assembly's cohesion. We should get the assembly's cohesion in terms of our work. I mean, if the assembly is working, and then we talk across purposes, if people are paying their rates, and some members themselves are not in to help to explain to the electorate, it creates a problem of understanding. And if they don't also pay, the assembly loses money. We need to understand that to take off even sanitation, it takes money. The people should pay in an agreed manner, where the higher will pay higher and the lower will pay lower, but eventually it should be full recovery. If not, they themselves might move against it at their various areas. So it affects development, it affects sanitation, it affects revenue, and the uh, uh, assembly will be the worse off. So it's in our interest to get it done, so that subcommittees will be formed who will be in charge of various sectors from where they can explain issues totally to all the assembly members and community at large. For perfect understanding and collective position of the assembly, a united in development, so that we don't get anybody talking against the developmental agenda. And there's an assessment that says what we are witnessing, this uh, protracted you know, inability to elect a PM, boils down to politics. And it also comes because of the atmosphere we're in now. We're going into an election, uh, which is what is influencing the challenges we're seeing. Do you agree with that assessment? Well, I would wish you had taken the history of KMA into consideration. And remember, KMA had been there before. It was my part. You do remember Kobe mm -hmm. They were all there, and they had issues like this coming. True. So much as you cannot rule politics, politics in what form? And more particularly in Kumasi, if MPP in power, it also happened. What was the form of politics that happened? So we cannot do it in isolation unless we combine everything. So we should look beyond the politics, which may have come, to what is really informing the Kumasi situation. Because for the time MPP were in power, we also had a, a similar thing happening. So it is yes and no question. But the point is that when we come to see that we are collective in our action, and that's the direction we are going now, I'm sure we'll do a lot. And what to work towards that realization. So that that infusion of politics will be eliminated. But I'm sure when we do a bit of history and come to what has happened, we'll get a very nice story to write about KMA and local governance. What sort of security arrangements are you putting in place for tomorrow's vote? No, no, there's no special security arrangement. We don't anticipate anything beyond the behavior. What happened and I saw on tele happened outside. So what it means is that we have to restrain the distance of those who are not assembly members. So we'll find out the best way. We'll take advice. In fact, we'll put in security measures, not too extensive, because the people also matter, but just enough to ensure that we don't go through any bad uh, hitches. Mr. Kong, thank you very much for your time here on The Pulse. That's, uh... You're welcome. Thank you very much. That's the Ashanti Regional Minister there, Alexander Khan. And you're still with us here on The Pulse. And we stay uh, in the Ashanti Regional Capital because the Kumasi Central Market is encouraging traders to ensure proper uh, documentation of shops as registration for shop allocation ends. Now, authorities say the situation could affect the appropriate allocation of shops to rightful owners when allocation begins. Work is set to begin on the central market reconstruction project is expected to be completed in 30 months. Uh, both the Kumasi Central Market and the Kijitia Bus Terminal are expected to undergo uh, the new phase. Prince Apia reports. The Kumasi Central Market have been engulfed by fire for so many times in the past three years. 
it is expected to be redeveloped and reconstructed to decongest and address the perennial fire problem. Authorities began the registration process nine months ago to compile a list of all traders at the Kumasi Central Market for allocation of shops at the KJTR redevelopment site. Market manager Charles Nixon is excited with the extent of cooperation but worried at documentation presented by the traders. From these, uh, the shops that are in the market now, about 99% are inheritance. And most of the, you know, the original allotees are dead. And since uh, we cherish our uh, parents too much, we sometimes leave their names on some of these shops. But we are building a new data and we can, we can continue, you know, um, leaving the, you know, these uh, names in, the, in, the, in our books. These are ghost names. So we need to bring in those who are alive. So in that case, you need to go through the, the procedure for you know, changing the names to the one who will be succeeding the one you know, who passed on. Yes, that's why we are saying that, um, for instance, if we are to you know, um, give out the new shops, we can't give it to the dead people. Definitely, it has to be given to the alive, those who are alive. So, if you come and, you know, the person name is, you know, we cannot find the names in our books, definitely um, you are not going to be given a new allocation. So, it is proper for everybody to go through the proper procedure to be able to, you know, uh, uh, for us to be able to capture the person in the data that we are building. At a stakeholder meeting on Friday, unregistered and especially tabletop traders demanded explanation on how to still stay in business under the new process. Authorities expressed worry at the last-minute approach by some of the traders to register. Market manager Charles Nixon says though the process officially ended on Friday, unregistered traders can still be enrolled. And there are some spots that are in the system that are not yet captured. So officially it's coming to an end, but as assembly we, have, we haven't finished registering the people yet. Uh, and we continue to do that until the last person is captured. Project consultant for the Brazilian firm contractor, Emmanuel Danso says 98% of the traders have successfully been registered. For Joy News, Prince Apia. Reporting. You're still live here on The Pulse. We'll take a short break, but when we return, we'll tell you what the relationship is between political and temperate language and terrorism. We're hearing from uh, Head of Research at the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Centre, Dr. Christine, who's been drawing a link there. He believes there's a strong correlation. We're exploring his thoughts right after the break.